Okay, um, hi everyone, welcome to the webinar. Um, today's topic is rethinking intern company pricing for in-house treasury operations. And just a little bit background, uh, as, as we all live in the reality that for the past two years, the COVID-19 crisis has severely impacted many businesses uh, globally, resulting in disruption to supply chains and reduced profitability. So existing and the new funding arrangement, including the external banking facilities, will be critical in supporting companies' cash flow needs during the pandemic and beyond. So although um, the impact will vary across uh, the countries, industries, and the companies, many companies will have changes in their intercompany funding arrangement. Uh, this creates uh, transfer pricing risks and opportunities which may call for a reassessment of the existing intercompany policy related to the intercompany funding to meet the liquidity needs of the business. This is also the motive, uh, motive of the webinar today. And uh, if you have any questions or comments during the webinar, please feel free to use the chat box function from the floating interface you can see on the right of your, uh, right of your like, screen. Um, now I will give the floor to Yarif to start the main discussion. Yarif. Yes, can everybody hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Zoe, for uh, this introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody, uh, and good afternoon uh, to you all. Um, it's, it's interesting, you know, the, the title that you see right now is indeed Rethinking Intercompany Pricing for In-House Treasury Operations, which actually implies on a cash pooling, on internal finance management, and of course, because we're talking about related parties of transfer pricing. The original name, I mean, it's not actually the original, but the name that you've seen in all the publication, even I think in the, also in the reminder that you received was transfer pricing and intercompany finance, not only the end of LIBOR. And uh, I would like, just like to touch a couple of words about that and why, Transfer pricing and intercompany finance, naturally, that's the title, but why not only the end of LIBOR? Um, so let's let's start first with the LIBOR, uh, but just saying a couple of words, but then uh, uh, my colleagues, uh, Zoe and Victor, who are really proud to be there uh, today with them and presenting, uh, will take, uh, we'll take that subject uh, further. Um, so everybody now thinking about right, because on New Year's Eve, uh, and has a lot of people, analysts, bankers, advisor, leaders, and also uh, many articles define uh, the end of LIBOR like something that they called a piece of financial history uh, because after 45 years, because of all the scandal you heard about it, it's the end of LIBOR. And this is a very dramatic uh, uh, point right now um, because uh, it has a huge effect on benchmarks, on legal agreements, and of course, uh, uh, also uh, with the COVID-19 and everything that's going on, it's a real a dramatic issue. And, uh, you know, the alternative uh, method, uh, the alternative uh, uh, rates that will have to be determined. So naturally, uh, when everybody is doing a transfer pricing of intercompany finance these days, the um, the instinct is to go straight to the end of LIBOR because everybody keeps talking about it and it's true. And you know, there's no word to describe it, it's dramatic. But we uh, titled that not only the end of LIBOR because in the end of the day, we are talking about transfer pricing and intercompany finance. And as, as always said, as I always said in other webinars in TPA uh, and also in lectures, and articles which are involved or right, these transaction always, even today, you know, I say that like a couple of years ago, 10 years ago, and I must admit, I also always say that today. It's the same case. These financial transactions are, you know, sometimes treated as less significant transactions because we're when we are talking about uh, transfer pricing, naturally, we're talking about the distributor, 
service provider, about marketing services, about management services, R&D services, the license transaction when you grant a certain know-how to another related company and so on and so on. And one one's is always uh, uh, intends to forget about the finance transaction when in fact worldwide tax authorities and the best project and UN guidelines and specific countries, most all of the countries, by the way, they are adopting and treating this as a, a very important transaction. And in some countries, you all you even have to declare as it as an intercompany transaction. So it's transfer pricing and intercompany finance, not only the end of Libra, but I would say, but also the end of Libra. And with that, I will stop uh, talking about the Libra because my colleague uh, will talk about it uh, right uh, after me. So we're going back to rethinking intercompany pricing for in-house treasury uh, operation. And uh, let's go please uh, to the next slide. All right. So the subject of functions, assets, and risk, uh, we're all familiar with that, right? That, that, uh, that is not coming straight. Um, you know, that, that is not coming straight from uh, from a finance transaction, we seen that in all of our transfer pricing studies. Um, when we have a certain company, let's say it's the IT holder, it is the manufacturer, um, also doing the R&D quality control, and we have, let's say, the distributor. So we know the functions of the distributor. We know the functions uh, of uh, of the entrepreneur, the IP holder, um, and then we're going uh, to the risks, um, and then we're going to the asset, which is mainly intangible. You've seen that, we're gonna see that again and again and again. But I really like to speak uh, about uh, functions, assets, and risk in financial transaction in the internal, uh, I would say, cash pooling treasury in-house transaction. So um, let's, let's talk about that. First of all, the structure, the finance, the finance structure when we have the cash pooling leader and all, all the other companies, and you know that, is it's managed in such a way that uh, I would say first it's assumed um, that within a multinational, I would say there is some level of implicit guarantee from the ultimate parent company. And that means that the risk of the participant defaulting is very low. So uh, the ultimate uh, investment holding company, which is the leader of the cash pooling is actually a service provider in this case. And we expect it to be remunerated on a cost plus basis. And we'll touch that in another slide or so. And the participants depositing funds uh, in this investment uh, holding company, which of course is part of the group, are carrying a limited risk associating with the participants borrowing because the share of deposits and borrowing ultimately determines the profit or loss generated this arrangement from the leader. So in other words, if we're talking about function, that's the function. Like so like we have an IP holder and a limited risk distributor. So like a mirror, like a mirror here, we have a cash pooling leader, which is the uh, investment holding company. And we have the borrowing, the participating, the depositing funds within the group, which are carrying the limited risk. There are the limited risk, but not the distributors, but the limited risk of finance with the participants board. So that's the functions. Now we come to the risks. So again, in a, in a routine functional or even non-routine functional analysis that we're doing on a transfer pricing study, you have uh, your, uh, for example, R&D risk, you have your inventory risk, if inventory will go up, so who will pay for that loss. You have the product liability list, you have credit risk, foreign exchange risk, um, uh, uh, a, a warranty risk, market risk, and so on and so on. Again, we are all familiar with that. But what happened in this internal finance, finance transaction within the group? What risk we may have in this transaction? So like I've mentioned credit risk, credit risk in a general intercompany transaction, meaning that uh, for example, the distributor uh, will not be able to collect the money for the products ha that has been distributed. 
So who will bear that? Either the interpreter or the distributor. That depends on the function analysis. And in the end of the day, we'll characterize, of course, what kind of distributor that we'll have. But what happened in financial transactions? So here, credit risk is actually a risk that the borrower will be unable and the borrower, again, who is the borrower? The borrower is the one who borrowed from the investment holding company within that group, one of the subsidiaries, one of the related party. The borrower will not be able to pay its interest or repay the outstanding balance in according with the terms and the condition of the arrangement. That is the credit risk of the borrower, where the lender bears the credit risk of the borrower not being able to pay its obligation on time or full. Because the borrower pair bears the risk that lender will default and that the borrower would be required to find a new lender. We have to remember that this credit risk is associated with the transaction both as a borrower and as a lender, because in a classic situation, normally, like in a low risk distributor model or service provider model, and one company is not bearing the risk, or, or I would say bearing a very limited of the risk, where the other, the other company is bearing almost 100% of the risk. In this case, both the borrower and the lender bears the risk. But the risk is, however, very limited, and it's very unlikely that, as the, that the group, you know, that the leader of the group, that the ultimate uh, investment uh, company, holding company of the group, would, would, it's very unlikely that it would let any of the subsidiaries default an, on its obligation, and we'll talk about it in soon. Another risk, which I find very interesting, is the interest rate flux, uh, fluctuation risk. This is the risk, I would say, that arises um, yeah, to either party, to either party from a change in interest rates. For example, the short-term base rate and a spread is applied to price the cost of funding and fluctuation in the base rate will cause risk for either um, the ultimate uh, uh, leader or the participant. Um, let's talk also about risks that related to the profitability of the arrangement. So let's say that the ultimate leader initially carries the risks to potential profits or, uh, determined, or detriments that might arise uh, from the structure in place. And let's say we come to year end after we, you know, implemented all, all that, and the leader will assess the arrangement and allocate the profits or uh, um, uh, the risk of the default of the participants in the structure will be considered very limited. And therefore, I would say the risk of the depositors is reality associated with the applied interest between the leader and the participants. But if the arrangement is resulting in a loss for the financial year, and that, of course, can happen, and especially now with the LIBOR scandal and with the COVID-19 and everything. So this is mainly due that the leader having either paid the depositor with too high interest or claimed the too low interest from the borrower. And the leader will attempt to realize a net profit result as close to zero as possible. Another uh, very uh, important risk, which will also appear later, but we'll talk about it right now, is the foreign exchange risk. Now, foreign exchange risk is, you know, is uh, automatically related to money and finance. And in the usual way, we're talking about like a company like uh, that sells, uh, for example, in Great Britain uh, pound, and the distributor is using U.S. dollars. And let's say uh, there is a fluctuation between those. Uh, these two currencies, so who will bear the loss uh, of that risk, for example, and that also comes to hedging and things like that. In our case, in the cash pooling, in the internal finance transaction, I would uh, say that foreign exchange risk is really the risk that arises um, because of fluctuation in foreign currency exchange. But this, in this case, uh, you know, compared to other parts, it's important when the currency in the ultimate company is different than the lender or the borrower, the interest payable, and the prince, uh, principal with uh, fluctuation proportionality to movements in exchange rate if the currency of a credit debit balance is different than either the lender or the borrower 
currencies. So it's the same thing that relates 100% to the loans, to the cash, to the management of finance. Um, I would mention um, three more risks, and they are not mentioned always, but I would mention anyway. Um, one of them is that uh, the uh, investment, international, the, the investment holding company, basically can carry a certain liquidity risk in respect uh, to its finance operation, and this can happen, of course. It's not uh, something very, very unusual because you know it derives excess funds primarily from uh, from the deposit it receives. And to manage this liquidity risk, excess funds are typically from our experience and from a lot of multinational we are working on and assisting them in writing and drafting their intercompany finance and cash pooling policy. So in other, in many cases, excess funds are typically invested in short-term assets because that will provide the flexibility to meet the group uh, cash need. Um, another uh, not known or not mentioned, maybe behind the curtain or maybe even psychological, but very important according, I mean, that's what I think, and in my opinion, another uh, risk, I would uh, call, call him a reputational. What is a reputational risk? Uh, the risk of reputation in finance transaction is actually that the impact of letting a subsidiary, if you're the leader of the group, and you're letting a certain subsidiary in your group default. If you are letting a subsidiary default, make you may cause a reputational risk. And of course, we uh, we will not want to be in a position to be associated uh, with defaulting companies because a bad reputation, as we all know, can impact future business corporation um, and also interests uh, and future loans and future intercompany uh, arrangement. Uh, so, of course, the reputational risk is borne by the investment holding company. And the last risk I would like to discuss before I will go to the assets is actually the operational risk. So, I think that operational risk could be characterized as a risk of direct or indirect loss resulting from inadequate or failed information system, technology failures, we know that, Breaches in internal controls, sometimes unfortunately fraud, unforeseen catastrophes, um, you know, COVID-19, of course, or other operational problems that may result in unexpected losses. And again, this operational risk is borne by the investment holding company leader, the cash pooling leader. So we talked about functions in this finance transaction. We talked about uh, risks. We gave a lot of uh, uh, examples for risk. And let's uh, put a word also about the assets employed. So again, assets in regular functional analysis uh, uh, reports, uh, we are asking basically who is holding the, uh, the patents, manufacturing intangibles, the marketing intangibles, reputation, things like that, um, and who is holding the intellectual property, and economic versus uh, legal, we all know that according to the BEPS project. Here, here, assets employed in the financial transaction in a cash building, I would say that the assets employed that are the main, um, I would say that the main assets employed in the intercompany finance transaction is the cash being deposited and or withdrawn. And I would say further than that, I would say that efficient cash management uh, in a huge or big organization requires know-how and skilled professionals. And accordingly, we expected this kind of thing, I mean, also other things, but this kind of thing to be managed by skilled personnel with experience in cash management and other financial services. I would summarize that, say, um, and we uh, know that in TPA for so many years, like a good and flexible IT system, able to work together with the software of the third party, bank cash pool system, whatever, this will also be a key to efficient cash management. So to conclude that, that, that has been quite long, but I think it's very important. And I think not many people are talking about that. Um, and I think that's crucial to speak about that. Um, so as participant 
uh, in the investment holding company system, um, when the lenders only performs routine function, bears limited risk and deploys limited tangible assets, the leader performs coordination, agency factions, bears some risks, employ uh, also assets as the role. But in the end of the day, transfer pricing manners, once we've done that, um, we're talking about a service provider to the arrangement. Um, now let's talk about, um, yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's move to the next slide. All right, um, so just before I, I, men, I will mention full costing versus margin cost, and I know I ran out of time, um, I'd just like to mention something more about, I think that was the, actually in the previous uh, uh, slide, and sorry about that, about the main uh, central company. Um, so I would say that the main central company is exactly what we said, the cash pool leader, the entrepreneur, uh, equally in regular transaction, intercompany transaction, which are not financed with the IP holder. This is the one who usually uh, is usually performing routine coordination function when this is a, a notional cash pooling and is entitled to routine cost plus return. And uh, this, is, this is his function. And then there's the question that always arises. I mean, I've been asked always that, is the central company entitled to the non-routine profit? And I would say normally not, normally not entitled to non-routine profit. And therefore any excess interest, in income uh, should be allocated among the participants. And I would also say that in case of excess interest, income and allocation, they should be made uh, to the depositors or to the borrowers in that case, in the case of overall income expense. The allocation usually made on depositor, borrower, average balance. Okay, um, let me just see where we are. Um, okay, full uh, full costing and uh, versus short term. Um, we, all, we all know that, um, so let me just say that. I would say that as the purpose of a cash pool arrangement, um, I would say the purpose of it is to support the short term the short-term operational financing required merit of the subsidiaries because that's the most important thing for the ongoing management and operation of the group. And then if any balance become long-term or structural in nature, then I probably this balance should be removed from the cash pooling arrangement. This is very important because we have to decide what to include within the arrangement and not and what to get out. So I would say again if any balance become and we know how to define the long term uh, or structural in nature. I would say I would suggest remove it from the cash pool arrangement, with the, which again has to take care of uh, the uh, the short term operational and ongoing things. And as such, I would say the intercompany balance between the participants considered uh, short term. And uh, I will say about how to deal with the historical loans. And, and existing loans when doing m as is that when you're receiving already, I would just say that you're receiving already facts and circumstances, and sometimes uh, it fits you very well, but sometimes it doesn't fit you very well. For example, uh, let's say they were using uh, Libor, like everybody used, and now uh, the Libor is not effective anymore, and uh, 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 Zoe and Victor will talk about it, how can you still use Libor, or maybe, uh, uh, this arrangement wasn't good for you, but it, it, let's say you acquired the group of companies which already has a cash pooling arrangement. So tax authorities today are really keen and really intend to accept whether in pre-ruling or not in pre-ruling, uh, they are keen to uh, accept a, a new policy provided that you're proving to them in a sufficient TP documentation um, that uh, nothing really changed in a matter of uh, paying taxes. So it's really uh, important to relate to the old uh, regime and also uh, the new regime. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay. So um, before we'll talk about uh, transfer pricing study, let me just uh, give another word about 
because the you know the title of our webinar and I think uh, also the slide there mentioned that was about what should be the treasury role in organization. So um, I would say uh, in policies that we drafted, we wrote that uh, treasury department is basically responsible for setting the appropriate base rates and the transfer pricing team is responsible for setting the arms leg spread. So it's like really a corporation and combination of two teams. Well, the treasury department actually setting the appropriate base rates. But again, because we are talking about one group and related company, then the transfer pricing team, whether external or internal, really supports the treasury department to setting the arm's length spread, or in other words, make sure everything is in our length. I would say also the treasury team provides on a yearly basis the credit limit. They're also onboarding new participants. There's also the termination of credit limit, and of course, uh, blocking and uh, unblocking of payments. Regarding the transfer pricing uh, studies, so here, here we have to remember, this is also very, like, you know, like I mentioned in my opening remarks, when financial transactions sometimes seem like a secondary transaction, and which is really not the case today, and actually, to be honest, not for a very long time, that goes also uh, to the documentation. Because in the end of the day, we are all used uh, to documentation that involves the sales and marketing, the license, royalties, uh, profit split, TNMM, we've all been there, that's fine. But financial transaction required the same complicity, the same um, detailing, the same attention as regular, I would say, if you can call that regular transfer pricing study, which means that the TP study has to include comparables, we have to include fixed rates, maturity, swap, margin, and let me say something about the comparable bonds. Uh, chapter 2, paragraph 2.3 of the OECD transfer pricing guidelines, the OECD transfer pricing guidelines with all the pillars and the BEPs, um, and then most of the country adopt that in its local regulation. So this chapter two uh, actually saying that where the cup, and we'll talk about it in a minute, another transfer pricing method can be applied in an equally reliable manner, the cup method is to be preferred. And we know that, and that's always the case and also in financial transaction. And in this case, external caps are basically today a valuable for this transaction. Since companies, I would say, with the same credit rating have the same probability of default and thereby, we can see that as quite similar. The, the time, like many years ago, that we used uh, agreements between companies to see what interest rate they were adopting really, uh, really, uh, don't, uh, really doesn't work uh, today, but quite for a long time. Today, we have all the ability to use external database like Moody's, like Financial Bloomberg, uh, and also others to determine what would be our bond comparables. And in that way, we can determine what would be the arm length interest rate, whether we're using bonds, whether we're using uh, our loans, whether we use cash pooling credits, um, guarantees, and more and more. Next slide, please. So also here, you know, like, the US, we know the best, best best method rule, and in most of the countries, uh, we have to uh, you know pick up what would be the transfer pricing method we would use, and to explain if we are not picking the first one in the hierarchy in the pyramid, why that wasn't our first choice, and therefore we're going to the next one until we reach what we need, and this is of course always will be uh, something that we discuss in TP audits. Uh, I would say that uh, in this case, in this case, uh, um, it's really the cup or the cut. Cup comparable uncontrolled price and cut equivalent uh, in the US comparable uncontrolled transaction, which is basically the same thing. Uh, there are, there are ma minor differences, but we won't get into that right now. Um, we can sometimes use additional methods like certain val finance valuation methods. Uh, certain uh, profit split method in the sense of uh, splitting uh, profits 
uh, of yields of bonds, of average credit rating, things like that. And in the end of the day, statistically proven, I would say that in most, in not in maybe in, maybe even in all cases, we are using the cup and the cut, like I explained. And of course, like in other NETP study, this TP study of finance should also include description of all the search provided. And if we're doing the cup or the cut, and that's what we're doing, and we're using uh, the bonds, we have to also include, whether in the study or in the appendix, the list of the underlying bonds that have been used for the benchmarking. So to conclude that, transfer pricing study in cash pooling in finance, no different from other transfer pricing documentation. And that's the way tax authorities worldwide are also treating in uh, this way. So that concludes my part. Uh, I hope it uh, wasn't too long. Um, I really uh, uh, wanted uh, to give focus to, uh, to these functions, assets, risk, and things like that, because uh, usually we're not discussing them uh, in webinars. And by that, uh, I, uh, I give it over uh, to Zoe to continue this lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arif. Can we move to the next slide, please? Yeah, now we're going to talk about the credit ratings. So on the slide, you can see uh, the factors that uh, banks would take into consideration when assessing a credit rating to an organization. And uh, these are the common factors that the, the we all going to receive. Like uh, if you want to check online that your industry, you can find the average of your industry and your type of organization and use your uh, the, use your financial statement to have a test. There are multiple tools that online that you can do a self uh, a self credit rating test as well. And move to next slide, please. Yes, and now we attach the picture of different credit ratings from S&P. And uh, usually what we see is that uh, uh, the company that, has, that is categorized with the credit rating above uh, BB uh, shall be considered as a good credit rating company that usually have a better interest rate. And um, just to note, the credit worthiness may decline for many companies in the current environment. So it's very important to consider how many changes in credit worthiness impacts the uh, pricing of the intercompany financing transactions. So the credit rating estimation based on the historical data, which may not reflect the impact of COVID, may overstate the borrower's credit Therefore, the taxpayers or, or should consider use the forecast to financials, which consider the impact of the crisis. Next, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, before I move to uh, outline that score, um, so from pra uh, practical perspective, we see that the credit rating of the borrower used to price the loan is already a topic of the audit uh, so, if any, the reasons and the selection of the credit rating used for a particular M&E when pricing the intercompany group loans uh, must be documented properly to withstand the scrutiny and be prepared for the audits, including uh, questions like, does the group or the borrower have a public available credit rating, or how is the relevant credit rating determined? What will be looking like if you use public available tools, independent credit rating agency as, uh, assistant, uh, or like is the is the group credit rating used uh, different? Uh, use the method with a different one than the group entity, and the, if so, why? And also within the group, uh, there are questions be like be like um, will the borrower get the the group support in case? It gets into financial difficulties, and uh, uh, is the is the is the support in the format of uh, implicit support or based on the financial guarantee? Um, questions uh, like this, uh, like we recommend the the, the clients or the all the tax payers to properly document from day one as they design their intercompany financing uh, structure. And on the screen, you can see uh, Altman Z score um, as an alternative for to predict the bankruptcy. 
um, for people that are not so familiar with uh, the model, the Altman Z-score model is a measurement that is used to predict the, the chances of a business going bankrupt in the next few years, uh, which was developed by the American finance pro uh, pro professor Edward Altman in uh, 1968. Um, so if you like uh, uh, with the with this model if your result scored up to uh score less than 1.8 that means you're in a distress zone and if you you are from between 1.8 to 3 you are in within the gray, gray zone and if you are above 3 that means you're in the safe zone uh, can you please move, move to the next slide yeah, for the solvency of the uh, of the M &E, we like more frequently than ever we see the thin capitalization rules, uh, which include the debt equity ratio and the interest limit, interest deduction limit. Um, the next slide you can see like a map of all the uh, thin capitalization rules in Europe, in their local uh, in their local law and uh, the implementation status. And my colleague, Victor, will talk about the LIBOR and the alternative reference rate to LIBOR. Victor? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, and thank you, Zoe and Yadi, for the great presentation. Uh, firstly, we're gonna start uh, with intra-group guarantee, and afterwards, we'll discuss the impacts of the LIBOR transaction. Uh, Thank you. Change the slides. A financial guarantee is an agreement that guarantees that a debt will be prepaid by the lender to another party if the borrower defaults. Essentially, a third party acting as a guarantor promises to assume the responsibility for a debt in case the borrower is unable to perform the payments. In these slides, you can see some examples why guarantee fees are normally required. Number one, the lender does not want to provide the loan without the guarantee. Or number two, the lender is only willing to provide the loan without guarantee for less favorable conditions. In, condu in conducting a transfer pricing analysis for guarantees, you should follow these three steps. Step one, accurate delineation of the guarantee. Step two, a quantification of the benefit. And step three, calculating the guarantee fee. The main focus of this presentation will be at step two or three, where we'll discuss the methodologies available to quantify the guarantee fee. Next slide, please. Important factors to be considered when pricing the loan guarantee are whether the guarantee confer, com, confers a benefit, whether the guarantee is implicit or explicit, whether the guarantee should be considered a services or a capital contribution, or whether the guarantee ha the guarantor has enough financial capacity to fulfill its obligation in case of default of the borrower. Please note that uh, for a guarantee to be considered a service that should be remunerated, the guarantee must be explicit and confer tangible asset to the borrower. Next slide, please. The OCD transfer pricing guidelines on the financial transaction stresses that in case of intra-group financing, the lender and the borrower's perspective should always be considered, and the same apply for the guarantee fees. Here you can see the lender's perspective, which is benefiting from a stronger credit rating of the guarantor, which translates to lower risk of default. The, the, sec the second benefit would be benefiting from guarantor asset pool in addition to the borrower asset pool meaning a combination of assets to guarantee the debt in case of default of both parties. The borrowers, in the borrower's perspective, you will find more favorable conditions and interest rates since the lender has an access to a wider pool of assets. It enables the borrower to access larger amount of funds and reduces the cost, the cost of, debt, of debt funding for the borrower. Next slide, please. Now for determining the arm's length compensation of the guarantee, let's start with the cup method. And this is what you should, continue, should consider when applying the cup for the guarantee fee. The first, you should consider the risk profile of the borrower and the lender, terms and conditions of the guarantee. If the guarantee is up to 1%, 10% of the loan, this might change according to each of the loans. 
Number three, the terms and condition of the underlying loan, which would include amount, currency, maturity, and seniority, and the other, other features. The fourth would be the credit rate and differential between the guarantor and the guaranteed party, and the market conditions. This could be used as an internal and external cup, which will, uh, we put a note that external cups are more difficult to find in, in this type of arrangements. Uh, next slide, please. Now we're gonna talk about the yield approach. The yield approach is used to determine the maximum fee. First, you determine the interest rate without the guarantee plus the implicit support, and afterwards you determine the interest rate without the explicit guarantee. The second step is to combine both features. To determine the maximum fee, you can subtract the first by the second, and you will have the maximum fee of guarantee. This is a good reference to support the pricing of the guarantee, and if this information is easily available to the m &E, it's also one of the simplest way to guarantee to determine the guarantee fee. Next slide, please. The cost approach is focused on a guarantor and is used to establish the minimum fee by determining the value of possible loss incurred by the guarantor. This can be achieved by the option pricing model and credit default so. This data is publicly available in the known databases. Next slide, please. The valuation of expected loss approach estimates the probability of default and consider the possible adjustments related to the recovery rate in case of default. This method can be determined using the capital asset pricing model known as CAPAN and the, and the, and the formula in the slides considering the recurring on equity and the recovery rate. Please let us know if you'd like us to share this presentation in order to use the formula later on. Next slide, please. The capital support method uses a different risk profile between the guarantor and the borrowers. The following steps should be considered. The first one, you determine the credit rating of the borrower without the guarantee plus the implicit support of the group. The second one, you will identify the additional notional capital required to reach the credit rating of the guarantor. The, the formula that can be used would be the guarantee fee would be the, expe the expected return on the required capital to achieve the credit rating of the guarantor. Next slide, please. In this example, we can see the BV, which is subject to a 5% interest rates. And after the restructuring and introduction of a guarantor, the interest rate dropped to 2%. Now we're gonna do a poll for you guys to um, respond to which type of method do you find appropriate to remunerate this type of uh, arrangement considering that the, the interest rate is lower due to the new guarantor that they acts in. Could you introduce the poll? We will wait uh, around 30 seconds and uh, we'll resume the presentation. Thank you for replying. Cup method yield approach is the winner here. Afterwards, followed by cost approach, yield approach, and evaluation of expected losses. Uh, as you can see on this, can you please return to the to the image of the example? Thank you. As you can see, the borrower has the economic benefit of three percent, but due to the two different situations. By using the yield approach, we can determine that the maximum guarantee fee is three percent. However, we should also consider that the BV is now part of a bigger group and might have a higher implicit support. This means that, in, that the guarantee fee on the yield approach should be a bit lower than 2%. Now we will discuss a recent topic, which is the transition of LIBOR and risk-free rates 
please let us know during the check function or via emails if you have any doubts regarding the guarantees or if you would like us to share the formulas that were displayed on the presentation. Uh, as you may know, has already been discussed here as well. The LIBOR, the LIBOR time is over after a really long period. But firstly, let's talk a bit, a bit of what is the LIBOR. The LIBOR is a reference rate used they were used in which banks provide lo short-term loans to each other. The LIBOR are globally used starting points to price financial product products such as uh, normally comprised of a loans and a spread, such as loans, uh, bonds, and other financial instruments. Can you please change that? The LIBOR is currently being replaced or risk-free rates reference rates due to scandal related to the manipulation of the library the scheme caused financial contracts to be misplaced throughout the world in transaction in transactions such as mortgages corporate fundraising and derivative trades next slide please in this slide you can see that uh, what are the trans the alternatives to the libraries on this one, you might see that the Sonia would be replacing the LIBOR on the GDP, and the uh, SOFR would be replaced. We're replacing the USD LIBOR. You might find risk-free rates for all the currencies. We we were doing a, currently research on that, and we saw that not all or not all current countries are up to date to this. But we would expect in a transition of six months to have recently available listening the available risk-free reference rate to use in the benchmarks and uh, to use as a new base rate for the agreements. Mm, next slide, please. Here we're gonna talk about the potential impacts of replacing the LIBOR in the intercompany agreement. Most intercompany agreements does not have a fallback position in case of discontinuation of the LIBOR. Such fallback clause, uh, uh, clause usually specify the triggering event for the new pricing to take effect, a alternative raise rate to be applied, and the necessary adjustments to, to the price in order to apply the all new all-in interest rate. Therefore, we suggest always the use of a fallback position that allow the contract to remain robust in a changing of environment. Without such fallback position, the replacement of the library might be considered a significant modification of the agreement. And one thing to consider when applying such fallback position is that this might be considered a significant modification of the agreement. And this might affect uh, in case of year, European Union grandfathering clause. Also, tax authorities may argue that uh, third parties would also tend to change other terms in the agreements when changing the base rate and performing a significant modification in the agreement. Uh, in the next slide, next and final slide, we prepare some points of actions for the companies to deal with the transaction, their transition for a lot to LIBOR from a risk-free rate. The first step would be to determine a transition plan from the library to the applicable reference rates and uh, determine the library expo exposure within the group. Third of all, evaluating the uh, selected alternatives. And fourth, conducting a tax analysis of, of how this would impact uh, your effective tax rate. It was a great pleasure to having you today. Thank you for joining today's webinar. And feel, please feel free to reach us out in case you have any questions. And uh, see you in the next webinar. Uh, we already have a question. Let me see. Yes. So we already have questions from the audience. The first one is from Vidushi Sharma. How is the implicit support quantified and considered for a credit rating of a subsidiary? Zoe, can you take this one? Yeah, I think this is related to the yield approach, is it? This is this can be related to the yield approach, which we would consider the implicit support of the group in case of default, meaning that the, as Riyadh mentioned on the reputation and risk, the parent would not 
would not uh, allow the, the subsidiary to default. In case of um, implicit support, the, in terms of the guarantee and the relation to implicit support, the guarantee fee might need to be explicit and implicit support is something that you would consider a higher carrier rating without something being explicit in terms of the services. The implicit support should not be remunerated while the guarantee fee should. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Uh, there are no more questions at this time. Uh, it was a pleasure having you all here today. Uh, please feel free to contact us by email in case you have, want to dis further discuss these topics. And uh, we see you in the next webinar. Do you have any, any further remarks here, Eva or Zoe? Um, no, I think uh, I think that we ended uh, with the LIBOR, and I think we should have done that. I think it was very important to start everything but the LIBOR and end with the LIBOR. And yeah. I really think uh, this issue is very crucial, and I urge uh, everybody who participants and other person who might uh, enjoy that later in the recording or getting the slides uh, to send uh, us emails uh, with questions. We would be happy to furthermore uh, elaborate on that. Again, this is uh, not very new, but in a way it is new uh, and changing dynamically. So uh, that would be my remarks, and thank you very much for everybody.